Hi everyone, thanks for joining in today. I'm excited to have Jane Caro joining me. Thanks, Jane. Hello, lovely to be here. Just a little bit about Jane. So Jane Caro AM is a Walkley Award-winning Australian columnist, author, novelist, broadcaster, advertising writer, documentary maker, feminist and social commentator. So that's quite a few things going on there. Jane appears frequently on Q&A, The Drum and Sunrise. She's created with pres sorry, she has created and presented five documentary series for ABC's Compass. And she and Catherine Fox present a popular podcast with podcast one, Women with Clout. She writes regular columns in Sunday Life. She's published 12 books, including Just a Girl, Just a Queen, and Just Flesh and Blood, a young adult trilogy about the life of Elizabeth Tudor, and the memoir Plain Speaking Jane. She created and edited Unbreakable, which featured stories women writers had never told before and was published just before the Harvey Weinstein revelations. Her most recent non-fiction work is Accidental Feminist, about a fate of women over 50. The Mother, which I have here, oh, is it going to show my copy? Here's my copy of The Mother. Um, the Mother is her first novel for adults and um, just want to say to anyone watching that if you ask a question just type it in comments and I'll read it out to Jane and you'll have a chance to win a copy of The Mother thanks to Ellen and Unwin. So thanks so much for joining us Jane. Um, just wanted to mention as well I started reading The Mother and I think I started reading it on Tuesday read a little bit the next few days and then last night I still had about half of it to read and re stayed up really really late to read it not just because I was interviewing you but because um it re like I really really needed to know what was going to happen so absolutely loved it it was five stars for me very emotional very thought-provoking um thank you very much for writing it oh, Thank you um, for that lovely feedback. Uh, it's always great to hear that mm. people enjoy it. Because you put a lot of time and effort into writing a book, so you really hope readers like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just wondering, do you want to start off by telling us a bit about the mother? Absolutely. Before I do, I would like to say that uh, I'd like to pay uh, my respects to uh, uh, the elders of the land on which I am, uh, from which I'm speaking to you, the Wanarua people. Uh, uh, and to acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging, um, because this uh, always was and always will be, like every square inch of Australia, Aboriginal land. Mm -hmm. So after saying that and paying my respects, uh, I would like to talk about The Mother. So The Mother is a novel about an older woman. Uh, she's in her late 50s, I suppose, when we first meet her. And she's a bit smug, really. You know, she feels like her life's been going pretty well. She's been married uh, happily to a lovely man for many decades. She has two daughters um, who, you know, she mostly gets along with pretty well. She has a better relationship with her older daughter than with her younger daughter. But, you know, she loves them both dearly. She has one granddaughter and she has hopes of having more. She has a lovely house. She has a successful business. She has a beautiful garden, you know. Uh, life's going well. She's a middle-class woman in a middle-class life, comfortable, protected, safe. Mm -hmm. And then just after her youngest daughter marries, um, a very charismatic man who Miriam really likes, her beloved husband goes to work one morning and is felled by a massive aneurysm, quite out of the blue, uh, live one minute and dead the next. And this is uh, a blow that um, Miriam almost feels she can't recover from. Uh, and she's furiously angry with him. She knows it's completely irrational that she should be so angry mm -hmm. because as her um, colleague and friend Prisha says to her, I'm sure he'd rather still be alive, but mm -hmm. it doesn't help. She feels like he's just gone, you know, mm. just at the point when their girls were launched and 
they could start to enjoy the fruits of their labor he leaves her high and dry really and she struggles to come to terms with this and of course it makes her turn more to, towards her daughters and her eldest daughter is lives nearby has a lovely husband beautiful girl that's perfectly fine but her younger daughter has been whisked, whisked off to a um, country town a couple of hours away because she's married a vet and of course he works with large animals so he has to work in a rural area and so she finds it really hard to make contact with this daughter and they've always had a slightly scratchy relationship where they've sort of you know Miriam always feels like when she talks to Alison she just puts her foot in it she just says the wrong mm -hmm. thing and the more she wants to get close to her daughter the further she drives her away so she's always quite tentative and over time you know Alison even after she has a little boy and then she has another child she holds her mother at arm length, arm's length and Miriam is bewildered and and worried and indeed um, Alison's husband Nick seems to imply that Ali may be struggling mentally uh, after having had the two children and Miriam's prepared to believe that because she's always been a slightly difficult girl and she feels both worried and resentful that her daughter mm -hmm. keeps her at such a distance she longs to have a relationship with her new grandchildren but you know she doesn't really suspect anything worse than that she's been a crap mother and that Alison's a difficult child and that they're all very raw because of the grief of the loss of Pete her mm -hmm. husband um and then suddenly out of the blue um Alison and the two children and Isla the little girl's really still a newborn arrive at um Miriam's house and seek refuge and then Miriam starts to find out just what kind of a relationship her daughter's been living in and just why she's been keeping her mother's mother at arm's length and far from that being any kind of resolution it actually opens up a can of worms that i don't think miriam ever dreamt of uh, in her life and it snowballs to the point where miriam has to make one of the worst decisions i think anyone could ever be faced with and I'm not going to tell you any more about it. No, we'll have to <laughs> no that's, that's a great summary. Thanks. So as I said, I really love the mother. I'm really interested to know what was the first idea you had for the book? Well, it came to me um, sort of fully formed. It dropped into my head because, um, you know, it, it came out of one of those stories that we see far too commonly um in our headlines one of those horrendous murder suicides where a man mm -hmm. murders his uh, partner and their children and then kills himself and mm -hmm. this happens with sort of relentless regularity and uh it rolls through the media for a few days and there were pictures in the paper and i saw one i don't know it could have been in the paper could have been online of the young woman in question her th her children next to an older woman wasn't her mother could have been a grandmother i don't know um older woman and her face was pixelated out and i'm a grandmother i've got two daughters uh, two grandchildren so i'm looking at this woman and i thought oh how must she be feeling now you know after this horrendous horrendous thing mm -hmm. and you know how must she have felt when the family realized that this man was never going to let the woman go or the children go and that he was terribly terribly dangerous you know i wondered you know what would i do what would how would i feel if that was me if that mm. was my daughter and my grandchildren and then i thought what would i do and then i thought well i know what i'd want to do and basically that was the genesis of the idea mm. for the book mm. and like I said, there's a lot of emotional and thought-provoking things in the book. Have What sort of feedback have you been getting from readers? And have you had people contacting you who have been in similar situations? or And how's that for you? Yeah. Well, it's it's kind of, in many ways, it's, it's, it's relieving because mostly the feedback has been how accurate um mm -hmm. i've been in mm -hmm. uh, describing coercive control and most and i was worried you know how would uh survivors 
uh, cope with reading this? You mm. know, would it be too close to the bone? You know, would they find it distressing? But actually, a lot of them have said things like, I feel seen. You know, I feel like um, my experience has been uh, validated and understood. And mm. um, I've had lots of people talk about their own situation um, and and how they, how they escaped or what they did. Um, and I've also had people, of course, talk to me about seeing other people in those situations because it's not my lived experience so the whole book is is from miriam's point of view and it's not her lived experience mm. either so mm. in a way miriam is a surrogate for us for those of us who watch and see these things happen from mm. the outside whether it's in a news story or and an, the neighbor down the street or a friend you know who, who whoever it might be mm. uh and the sort of bewilderment and and um shock i think that we all feel that these things can be going on mm. sort of without us noticing for such a long time. Yeah. And a lot of people have talked to me about that. Mm. And I've had, you know, quite um, straightforward responses like it kept me awake, you know, uh, I was, I wanted to know what happened next. Yeah. And all of that has been good. To my great relief, the responses have been almost exclusively positive. Yeah. Yeah, there were some quite disturbing things though as well, I'd have to say. Oh yes, there are. I didn't shy yeah. away from the fact. No. In fact, I worried at, some, at one point, I mean, from the technical perspective of the book and what I want the reader to experience as they read it, and of course a novelist is also working as a technician as they build this a story. Mm. Um, from that perspective, I needed to get the reader to really feel that Miriam had no other choice, so I had yeah. to ramp up, mm. I, I, you know, the the threat, I suppose. Mm. And at one point, I worried that I had jumped the shark, mm. and I went to a friend of mine who has, you know, we went to primary school together, but now he's uh, one of Australia's top family lawyers, and I went to him and described some of the scenarios at the climax of the book, which you mm. would be familiar with, and um, I said, look, you know, have I gone too far? And he came back, and this was you know, reassuring as a novelist, but devastating as a member of our society. He said, oh, you just summarised half the files on my desk. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it was kind of shattering to discover that even the darkest reaches of my imagination mm -hmm. had not gone too far. Yeah. And probably, yeah, what's in there isn't nowhere near as bad as the worst. And yeah. Perhaps so. Perhaps mm. so. I hate to think that, but yeah. who knows? Yeah. Mm. Mm. And we've got quite a few people watching, which is great. So just um, reminding the people watching that if you have any questions for Jane, please type them in comments and I can read them out and you can have a chance to win a copy of The Mother, thanks to Ellen and Unwin. Um, Sarah wonders, without being too personal or anything, have you ever had any experience or known anyone who's had experience with this sort of thing? Personally, I've not had any experience, which is one mm. of the reasons, as I said, that I decided to write it from Miriam's mm. point of view as an observer rather than a participant, um, because I didn't want to appropriate an experience I haven't had. Mm. Um, have I known anyone who's been in this situation? You know what? Probably. Yeah. That's a sad thing. Yeah. Have they told me about it? No, yeah. not until a long time afterwards. Mm. I have met people who've told me about previous relationships, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But anyone telling me about it while it was actually occurring? No. Yeah. And I mm. think that's normal. I think mm. that actually, I mean, Alison spends a lot of time at one point in the novel talking about why she tried to hide what was mm. going on why mm. she tried to pretend that everything was fine when it wasn't mm. and i think tragically um that is that is more the norm mm. than that you get confided in mm. Mm. and seeing as you hadn't had any personal experience or knew anyone how did you go about researching for the book I did a number of things. I mean, obviously, I I, I read um, Jess Hill's fabulous book, See What You Made Me Do, and that was a wonderful resource. Mm. I also went and talked to uh, people who worked in the sector, particularly um, Annabelle Daniel, who 
runs uh, Women's Community Shelters in New South Wales, a fantastic organisation that I now uh, donate to on a monthly basis. And um, she, uh, first of all, gave me a lot of encouragement to do this because I was a bit worried, you know, is it an appropriate subject for a novel? And she mm. reassured me and said no, that she thought it was really important that um, fiction dealt with these issues because it can um, not only reach a different audience, but perhaps uh, reach an audience in a different way, mm -hmm. less intellectual, more, you know, heart and guts. Uh, and she also gave me a really uh, fantastic resource, which was uh, a judge's summing up uh, at the hearing, uh, the, 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 the trial of a, a famous case, quite old now, but uh, in Sydney, where a man uh, threw his partner off a high rise mm -hmm. balcony. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he's still in jail for that. But uh, the judge summed up the whole um, case and uh, talked about the, how the coercive file developed. And, and that was an extraordinary um, resource to have because it did that uh, drip by drip by drip, how it slowly intensifies and gets worse and worse and worse. And mm. um, so that was incredibly useful. Mm. As I said, I spoke to family lawyers. A friend of mine is a judge. I spoke to her. Um, one of the women I'd featured in one of the documentaries I made that you mentioned in my bio had gone, spent a number of years in a Victorian jail. So I spoke to her. Mm. Uh, so I basically read widely, talked to as many people as I could. I talked to the police. They have a whole media unit just devoted i think to talking to novelists about mm. you know oh, okay. various yeah. procedural <laughs> things they're very generous with their time mm. but i do think they get a bit sick of it i uh, don't blame <laughs> them uh, but, so i you know i was diligent in um trying to be as accurate and uh authentic as i possibly could yeah be. Mm. and when you're writing an emotional draining scene how do you get in the right mode Well, the way I write things is I often see the scene in my head. Okay. And mm. I simply describe what I'm seeing. So it's like translating the movie onto the page. There's a there's an, a movie going on in my brain and I just write down what I'm seeing, hearing, feeling, you know, all of that. And I don't I don't actually find myself getting terribly wound up or I, I mostly I feel a sense of compassion and and interest mm. uh, but I think I think actually the technical side of being a writer probably in the same way that the professional side of being a therapist gives you a kind of protective membrane which enables you to actually do your job but if you think about a therapist and the sort of terrible things they must hear about, yeah. if they got totally emotionally absorbed in the story, mm -hmm. they'd be useless to mm. their client. You have mm. to keep a kind of, uh, not not cold, a warm uh, distance mm. between you and, and what you've been told. And I think, I think writing a novel, certainly for me, works in a bit the same way. Yes, you're engaged and involved, but your purpose is to tell this story as clearly and as uh, evocatively as you can not to vicariously experience what your characters are experiencing yeah so yeah, yeah you know I, I would have to confess and maybe this turns me into a very cold-hearted person i mostly enjoyed the experience mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. you know it was a it was really interesting and i got very caught up in the movie inside my head mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great explanation, yeah. Mm. And Belinda says she's read and enjoyed your historical fiction books about Elizabeth I. Do, she wonders if you plan on writing any more in the historical fiction. It's certainly a possibility. Um, I'm never quite sure what I'm going to do next. But mm. interestingly enough, Belinda, when I finished writing The Mother and sometime after um while it was going through the you know editing process and all that kind of stuff i suddenly realized that um <laughs> i always write about the same thing even though it's dressed in very different clothes so the elizabeth trilogy is really about a woman uh, in a period of history when women had no power at all mm. and were considered 
not really human, sort of one up from animals. Um, I wrote about a woman who, against all the odds, managed to hold on to her power, who resolutely refused to give it away, not just mm -hmm. her political power, but her personal power as well, in an era where that really wasn't even a choice for mm -hmm. most women. But she took the circumstances in which she found herself and she created um, an extraordinary power base and she held on to it mm -hmm. um, until she died in her own bed, which is pretty rare for monarchs at that time anyway. Um, and that was one of the reasons I'd always admired her so much. And in The Mother, interestingly enough, as I realised long after I'd finished writing it, I'm writing about a woman who takes back the power. She does it yeah. mm. in a really dramatic way, but she she just refuses to be a victim. Mm. And she refuses to allow the people she loves to be victims either. And so she... She has lost her power in a lot of ways for quite a lot of the book. And I think coercive control, as I wrote about it, I started to understand that coercive control is really all about taking the power away from other people. So there's some sort of imperative in the person who needs to do it, mm -hmm. that their partner and their children should have no agency whatsoever, that mm -hmm. they should control them body and soul. They almost feel they own them mm -hmm. and that any sign of independence of thought or movement or anything is almost a betrayal. So it's a it's an extreme of the need to control others, the need to have power over others. And so that's what the first part of the book is about. It's about someone who takes other people's power away from them. And the second half of the book, I suppose, is about a woman who takes the power back. And back, then, yeah. as a result of that, loses power in one way, but mm. gains power because she starts to understand herself mm. so much better than she ever has before. So I always seem to be writing about women either holding on to or taking back or regaining their power. Yeah, yeah. And um, Kelly said that the mother's like the first in the style genre for you. Do you have plans to write more in this style, seeing how favourably it's been received? Well, that is tempting, um, though I was astonished that I could come up with this one. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I've got a lot to do in the next uh, couple of months because I'm promoting the book, obviously, but I'm also um, running for the Senate in New South Wales in the mm. next federal election. So I'm not really thinking much beyond whenever Scott Morrison finally decides to call the election. The latest will have to be the 21st of May. And once we get beyond that date, uh, then I will start to think about what from there, uh, either I'll be in the Senate, which will be a whole new adventure, and lots of grist to the writing. New yeah, writing you'll get lots uh, of good, yes, <laughs> good writing. I'll be taking over the <laughs> Or I won't, in which case, yes, I'll be thinking about what to do next. And just the fact that I'm running is is also extremely interesting and rich territory uh, for any writer. So, uh, no, at the moment, I'm only looking forward to the 21st of May. After that, who knows? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Watch the space. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, and Kelly says you've written such a wide range of novels. Has any been your favourite to write so far? I really have enjoyed writing them all. Mm. Um, I suppose I have a sentimental attachment to Just a Girl because it was the first novel that I've written that got published. And I learnt a lot doing it. And I found her story as a young woman so particularly fascinating yeah um in a way sometimes i think i cheated with those first novels because i didn't have to make up a plot you know her life was already there mm. i just had to do a whole lot of research and then flesh out the characters and to be honest with you i'm most interested in the characters that i write about it's people and relationships that fascinate me um, and that includes our relationships with ourselves. Mm. So I'm really interested in, in that. Uh, plot is a secondary thing to me. But the interesting thing with the mother, of course, is that the plot is um, the, yeah. really important. Mm. And um, I, I surprised myself because I never thought I'd be good enough 
coming up with plots to write something like this. So I've done mm. it once. Who knows? Yeah. I yeah. Um, find another idea and do it again. <laughs> yeah. And Kelly also says good luck with the upcoming election. Um, she's wondering if you'll write a political thriller in the future. Well, it's certainly uh, not an impossibility, is it? Mm -hmm. I reckon there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of material out there. So uh, if I get up close and personal, that could be very interesting. Yeah, it will be. Um, Holly wonders if you could tell us a little bit about your writing break and how you got your first book published. Sure. Um, I had been part of a writers group for a long time. And I would very much recommend if you're a, a would-be novelist or, or writer of any kind, if you can find yourself a writer's group, I think it's really uh, worthwhile. Mm. And I'd been, um, there were a, a couple of um, women in the group who were getting interest. One in particular was writing, and she has since been published. Uh, she was writing an extremely well-researched kind of um, romantic novel set in a part of Roman history, which is very rarely kind of written about the wars between um, Rome and uh, I think it's Etruria. And um, that was, you know, she was doing a fantastic job and she got some interest from a literary agent. Mm -hmm. And I was writing what I now realise was an excruciatingly bad attempt at a literary novel. And I uh, watched these women get interest and I thought, well, you, you know, you'd like to get published and what gets published? Genre novels. And I thought, well, what genre could I write? And mm. I thought, oh, crime. I thought, not clever enough. Well, I, I think I sold myself short there, obviously, because I've just done it. But nevertheless. <laughs> um, science fiction. Nah, don't know anything about it. Don't read it. Don't think it's right. Romance. Pass me the bucket. I'm not interested in romance mm. at all. Um, chick lit. Nah. And then I thought, historical. Oh, that, yeah, maybe I could because I'm really interested in history. I read a lot of historical mm. novels and also um, history, you know, uh, nonfiction and biography and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so I thought, oh, yeah. And, and then I thought, well, if I'm going to write a historical novel, uh, who could I write about? Who could I bear spending years researching? <laughs> yeah. and I thought, oh, this is the first, you know, I've already, mm. already I read everything I lay my hands on about her. I've probably done most of the research, famous last words. I found <laughs> out you need to know a great deal more than just as a casual interest when you're actually writing mm. as I did in her voice. So, you know, you have to kind of know the minutiae to get that convincing. And so that's how I launched on it. And I just wrote this stream of consciousness thing about her in the tower the night before she's to be crowned Queen of England. And I knew enough about her by this stage to know that all the kings and queens before their coronation at that period in history were lodged in the tower the night before they were crowned. But of course, her mother, Anne Boleyn, had been in a different part of the tower before she was beheaded. And of course, she herself, Elizabeth, had spent quite a long time as a prisoner in the tower mm. under the threat of the scaffold, mm. a prisoner of her sister Mary Tudor who had died and therefore she found herself in the royal apartments waiting to be crowned. And my conceit of the book was that she couldn't sleep the night before. She was a famous insomniac, Elizabeth I, she had trouble sleeping. So that was arguable as well and that she couldn't sleep the night before she was crowned. So to pass the night, she went back over her life and wondered, what have I learnt? What can I take forward? How am I going to do this job? And so that was the conceit of the book. So I wrote this stream of consciousness of herself in the tower doing just that. And when I took it to my writing group, they all went, that's fabulous. The best thing you've written. You've got to continue. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it happened. And then when I tried to get it published, I'd send it to all these publishers and I'd get, yeah, we really liked it. But no, we can't see how to market it. doesn't fit in your Australian mm. novelist. Mm. Why are you writing about an English queen, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, well, because in a way she's our queen too because we didn't exist, you know. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. that's an esoteric <laughs> argument no one was going to be convinced by. And uh, then a friend of mine who was uh, just getting published as a young adult writer, and I was, you know, telling her my tale of woe, and she said, well, could it be young adult? And I suddenly thought, Oh, shit, yeah. Yeah. She mm. said, well, it's my publisher. 
at UQP. So I did. And two weeks later, Christina Schultz sent me a contract. Oh, really? So yeah. Mm. Luck of it. Like, yeah. you know, just a lucky set of circumstances. Yeah. And I was very naive about the publishing industry and I'm a bit savvier now. Mm. <laughs> mm. No, that's a great um, publishing story. Thanks for sharing that. Rita wonders, when you start writing your books, do you plot your whole book or does the storyline just develop over time? You know, I'm not a plotter. Mm. Um, I really admire those people who, you know, write out everything in cards and all the characters and really get it all worked out beforehand. I think that's amazing. But no, I just start with a sort of vague idea and then I kind of write and I think, oh, and, and I often say to people, well, the way I do it is I write the first sentence and then I think, oh, well, the next sentence has to be that. Oh, well, the next sentence, you know, and I just, mm. it just mm. kind of um, flows out of me, which means the first draft is often very rough and ready and needs mm. to be, you know, really whipped into shape. But it seems to be I plan as I go and, and things happen that surprise me. So characters will pop up that I didn't ever know were going to be there. Yeah, and, yeah. And I do, but I do, I do on my walks. I often think about that, where I'm at and how to solve certain problems. Mm. And, you know, I'll get ideas as to where to take, to take things forward and that kind mm. of thing. So I suppose that's a loose kind of plotting. Mm. But yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a particularly organised kind of person. I'm mm. more of a fly by the seat of my pants and so I do that in writing books too mm. and what about with the mother did you know how that was going to end when you started yeah, pretty much yeah I I I sort of I knew the basic outline of the whole thing mm. I didn't know a lot of the characters that were going to appear along okay. the way yeah I, okay I, and I didn't necessarily I hadn't thought through the complexity of the relationships mm. and I had a vague sort of idea about what might happen, but no, I, mm. I, I guess I knew the basic trajectory, Yeah, but the details were murky mm. until I actually started to put them down on paper and then they sort of verified themselves. They appeared uh, on the screen as if they'd always been there and I just kind of, liberated them yeah. Oh, I think yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah and Kylie she says congratulations on the mother she's wondering if you've got any tips for an upcoming debut author based on your own experiences I think Kylie's launching her own book soon oh good on you Kylie congratulations uh, don't be afraid to ask so if you want endorsements ask for them People will say no if they can't do it. And you'll be surprised how often people say yes. Um, and get out there and, and promote it. Like uh, if your publisher asks you to do things, say yes. Uh, you know, you may get tired. It may be hard work and, you know, you may think, oh, but actually it does make a big difference to getting it out there and getting people to read it. Mm -hmm. Um, and also your editor is your best friend. I don't understand people who um, get all um, irritated by editors who want to change things up or make suggestions. In my experience, they're always working to make it better. And uh, if you go along with it rather than fight it, mm. uh, you'll often find that they unlock things in the book that you didn't even really fully know were there. Uh, I'm always open. I, I, I got my start in, you know, being a wordsmith writing and advertising agencies. And the great thing about that is you work in a team with an art director. And so you collaborate on absolutely everything together. Mm. And that taught me not to be precious. Mm. And I think uh, it's a very important thing not to be precious. Yeah. None of us are Shakespeare. Mm. Mm. And if someone comes along with a better idea that could improve it or shows you a way to do it that you think would be a better thing, mm. don't resist, go for it. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that advice. Kylie um, wonders what your favourite book might have been that you've read the, so far this year. And I'm wondering maybe what sort of books you normally like reading if you have your own a genre that's your favourite. Yeah, I'm a bit peculiar. Um, I really love kind of historical biographies. Um, and it's funny because when you get to be um, a published author, people send you books. And nobody ever sends me the books that I really want to read. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
Um, and sometimes the very books you write are not necessarily the ones you read, want to mm. read. So I'm always getting sent feminist books. And that some of them are great, of course, but I write feminist books. So there's a part of me that doesn't want to read feminist books for recreation. Um, so what have I read recently that I've really, really enjoyed? I've read a number. I've read, um, I picked up a book in Watermark at the airport and it was called The Mystery of Charles Dickens. And it's by A.N. Wilson. And I loved it. It's about... Dickens' divided life. And if I am going to write a historical novel, I tell you what, I've got a real interest in writing about Elizabeth Dickens, his mother, mm, who he okay. loathed, hated and detested. Mm. But I actually found in this book that she's very hard done by. Um, and I'm really interested in how famous men often project their anger onto their mothers or their wives particularly mm. in that particular era mm. and how unfair mm. that was so that was i can't recommend that enough it's really about dickens divided self there's an even an implication in the book that while he ran and financed a home for so-called fallen women you know he may also at the same time have been visiting prostitutes himself oh, and that's yeah. a fascinating uh, dichotomy mm. so really riveting book um then i read rodham by oh, curtis yes, yeah. Sittenfeld, mm. which is the novel about what would have happened if hillary hadn't married bill and mm. i i'd resisted it and then i you know did read and i absolutely loved it and curtis Sittenfeld is one of my favorite authors the other one she wrote was the american wife which is loosely based on laura bush and she's just fantastic at mm. um examining um women's roles uh in our modern society using these very famous iconic women as a kind of starting place and i'm in the middle of and i'm very late to this book but i'm really really enjoying it um the dictionary of lost words oh yes by yeah Williams, which is fabulous mm, that's and, a great um, one yeah I, I come to it late but i'm really really enjoying it it's mm -hmm. great Mm. And we've got some great comments from people watching as well. Um, Jen says, Jane, you're one of the greatest feminists in Australia. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> well, I'm certainly one of the noisiest. You could say that about me. <laughs> and um, Charity Norman said she loves your advice about the editing process. Yeah, I think... Um... Realise your editor only means you well. Mm -mm, mm. And I'm wondering what you hope readers will love about the mother. Well, I hope they'll love that they were absorbed by it. I hope they'll love that it opened their eyes to how insidious uh, coercive control can be. I hope they'll identify with and empathize with the relationship that Miriam has with her daughters and struggles to have with them, mm -hmm. that way mothers doubt themselves, blame themselves, take the responsibility for the relationship with their children on their own backs, you know, and how that's both admirable and also gets in the way. Uh, and I hope, I, hope, I simply hope they enjoy it. But I also hope they like Miriam. I know she can be a bit irritating, <laughs> but I, I grew very fond of her. Mm. And um, I hope I hope readers um, do too. Yeah. So do you think um, you'd be one of Miriam's friends? Yes, I think she'd be quite fun to have a glass of wine with, actually. Yeah. She's got a good sense of humour. Mm. And she is honest. She resists some things, of course, because she's not, you know, she's as bumbling as the rest of us uh, but i think you see the best of her when she's with jeremy um, yeah mm. she relaxes with him mm. there's no there's no undercurrent there's no um she has no responsibility and so she can be perhaps the girl she once was with him uh, you know families are wonderful things but we are all kind of burdened by the history the responsibility mm -hmm. the role we play and being outside of that sometimes is when we can be most ourselves mm. and i really like the person miriam is with jeremy yeah yeah well thanks so much for chatting to me it's been great talking to you 
just wondering if you okay. want to let people know how they can keep in touch with you and what's going on with things with you. Well, um, if you want to know more about the campaign um, that I'm uh, involved in as the candidate for Reason Australia, you can go to my website, which is Jane Caro number four reason dot com dot au, and we keep that updated. You can also register there if you want to make a donation and. We really, we're a David fighting all the Goliaths, so um, any amount of money is really gratefully accepted. Uh, you can also register as a volunteer, which um, is a great thing, and you can sign up to get the newsletter and just keep a, a, a weather eye on what's happening. And I hope if you're in New South Wales and when it comes down round to election time, you think about uh, uh, voting for Reason Australia. We will be above the line on the Senate ticket, me and my wonderful running mate, Hannah Ma. Uh, every Wednesday, we run a, a webinar called Reasonings with Jane. Um, last night, I spoke to Greg Mullins, who's the retired fire commissioner, who really, really takes it up to the government about mm. their um, complete lack of action on climate change and uh, totally inadequate response to the subsequent emergencies that we seem to be facing more and more often. Um, and uh, next week, I'm doing one with Chris Bonner, who's my co-author of uh, the first book I ever published, The Stupid Country, How Australia is Dismantling Public Education, and we'll be talking about uh, how everything's even worse now than it was when mm -hmm. we wrote it then mm. for public schools and public education. So, um, you know, there's lots of ways you can stay in touch with what I'm doing. As I say, I'm um, promoting my book furiously and running for the Senate at the same time, which has its advantages. But one of them is not that I am well rested at all. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm, I'm running really hard, but uh, I'm enjoying every minute of it. And uh, after May 21, who knows what I'll do? Mm. But I'll, uh, if I'm in the Senate, I will be fighting hard for issues like action on climate change, um, increasing, in, increasing equality and decreasing inequality in all kinds of ways. Um, public education, obviously, but also public health, social housing, and uh, integrity and evidence based policy making, not influenced by ideology or religious belief, but because the evidence and the experts say here is the answer to that particular problem. I know, radical idea. Mm. Let's do what's reasonable. So um, that's where I'm going for the next few weeks and I'd love you to join me and you're certainly welcome to follow me and just keep an eye on what's happening. Well, good luck with everything and thanks for chatting with me and thanks also to everyone who joined in. We had some great questions, thanks. Thank you so much and I hope whoever wins the books really enjoys them. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye everybody.